Welcome to Viewpoints. I'm Chris Graham. And I'm Crystal Graham. Today's topic is, is going to be fun, Crystal, because it's something that uh, a, a lot of us have noticed, maybe, if you've ever gone to your, your favorite craft brewery locally, anywhere in the valley, Harrisonburg, Stanton, Waynesboro, Lexington, you know, you think to yourself, wow, I've found something that's totally unique, nothing, nothing like this anywhere. But you know what's interesting is the more you delve into the topic of craft breweries, is this is a really interesting growing economic trend, not just in Virginia, not just here in the Valley, but nationwide. Well, and you're seeing more and more. We went to the Virginia Chili Blues and Brews Festival this last weekend, and you're not just seeing the big name brand beers anymore. You're seeing a lot of local breweries pop up there that you haven't seen before as well. Oh, yeah, and the number of, uh, of craft breweries nationwide, over 4,200 in Virginia, over 180 now. It's a billion-dollar industry in Virginia. It's about, it's getting close to 15% of overall sales of beer are craft brews. Actually, I say that, 15% of the beer sold, 20% plus of the actual sales are craft brews. And so it's something that, you know, traditionally you, you bought the name brand beer and that's what you bought, but now you have lots and lots of options. I'm calling it kind of the democratization of beer. I'm, I'm looking at it that way. I, I've got to politicize everything, right? So the democratization of beer is sort of a topic for us today, and we're going to get into the the craft beer industry and kind of help folks learn more about this phenomenon that you've probably stumbled upon uh, on your recent travels. Well, and it doesn't matter where you are in Virginia. Virginia, in particular, is above the nation as far as how many craft breweries that it has. And I think it's, you know, almost every day the numbers change as far as the number of breweries that are popping up. And, you know, we've had the opportunity over the years to get to know some folks who are actually opening these breweries and be able to learn a little bit about the experience from, you know, the brewery aspect to being available in restaurants to actually being bottled. Oh, the cool thing is, too, in a lot of these cases, the person who grows the hops makes the beer, sells it to you. They, they may even have the kegs out in the, in the restaurants and bottle it themselves. That's the neat thing about this is that uh, you, can, you can know that person you know, one on one. So uh, we're gonna have a couple of guests with us to talk about this phenomenon. First, we're gonna bring in Cheryl Wagner, the Director of Tourism for the city of Stanton and uh, one of the uh, founding members of the Shenandoah Beer Works Trail. Yes, thanks for having me. Yes, yeah. so talk about the Shenandoah Beer Works Trail. Tell us a little bit about the Beer Works Trail. Well, you know, we have been thinking about it for at least three or four years, um, and that's the Greater Augusta Regional Tourism, which is Stanton, Waynesboro, and Augusta County. Um, we knew that some new businesses were, were popping up in Augusta County. There were already three breweries in, in the city of Stanton. And, of course, Waynesboro, we knew that Basic City was coming. Um, so we started doing some research. We started talking to some beer influencers in Northern Virginia and Richmond, the kind of um, like visitor we'd want to capture and uh, and through our research they said you know Harrisonburg already has a, a pretty big brewery presence and Lexington now has Devil's Backbone and Blue Lab we think you should work together so uh, we launched our trail on May 16th this past year so we're looking at four months now of, of promoting the Shenandoah Beer Works Trail. And there are 12 member breweries, correct? There are. And representing, like you mentioned, Harrisonburg, Stanton, Waynesboro, down to Lexington. Yeah. And the idea for this is, I mean, looking at the website, uh, people can plot their, their travels uh, and learn more about the different beers. Because one thing about craft breweries is you're not talking about the standard issue beer. There's not just one beer that everybody serves. They each have their own unique niche. They do. and. Um, and they're all really different. I mean, we have farm breweries, you know, we have downtown breweries um, with uh, Harrisonburg and, and especially Stanton, um, just also different. And, and just their production and how much beer they make. Are they really just a small batch brewery or a larger production like Devil's Backbone is? So um, we're really lucky to have such a, a vast um, variety of different breweries on our trail. So this launched in May. Let's bring in Craig Nargi from Stable Craft Brewing Company in Augusta County, one of the members of the, the Beer Works Trail. And uh, you opened in April uh, with, with your new Stable Craft Brewing. Tell us about, now first off, and Craig also, you've had a, a business now, now in operation 10 years, Hermitage Hill, uh, a, a farm wedding venue, a farm event venue. Uh, and, and you've been active in the agritourism sector for quite a long time. Uh, but tell us, give us how, how you kind of evolved into the idea of wanting to open up your own craft brewery. Agritourism in Virginia is, is just is phenomenal. And it's, it's not only in the United States, but it's, it's 
nation, it's uh, worldwide. The European market for agritourism is, is just an exceptional business model to, to look at. People want to get in contact with where their, where their uh, food is coming from or make a connection to the farm for whatever their product is that they're, they're actually seeking. The agritourism in Virginia has developed over the years with a little bit of help from our General Assembly. It, it took a little bit of stimulation from the government to help open the doors locally. And once it was embraced locally, we've really taken off. But you know, agritourism is a responsible uh, aspect to be a business operator. You have to work with the farms around you because I can impact their harvest. I can impact their production. And so we don't want to be a bad neighbor. So understanding your surroundings immediately is one of the keynote things that we focused on as an agritourism site. Predominantly, people are looking for what we do on weekends and in the evenings, and that minimizes the impact uh, on, a, on a heavy agricultural area. And so if you can get past some of those identities with agritourism, you could really grow your business, and you'll have a lot more support that way. Uh, the ancillary benefit to agritourism is you're bringing people from anywhere from 20 minutes away to several hours away. And in the Shenandoah Valley, we get the leaf peepers coming in, and it's just phenomenal how many people are going to come here. And they're not only just coming for the day, they're coming for the night, they're coming for several nights. We evolved into a wedding venue because we're a horse operation. We're an equestrian center. The facility was built in the late 80s, and it was built to be a Tennessee walking barn. And it was designed to train horses. It wasn't there to work with the actual horse rider. So they would send a young stock in to be trained. And the facility was designed. It looks very showy. It's very pretty. And we took that and expanded on it because people really are captivated by that. And to make money in the horse business is, is next to, to impossible. Uh, so we, we were boarding 17 horses per month and traffic in and out and, and working with the owners and, and bringing people in that had never owned horses before. And over the years, trying to grow that business had just become more and more difficult. When the economy hit and you had some downturns and whatnot, well, nobody needs a horse. In the old days, everybody had a horse just like a car. Well, it just turns into a giant hobby or a sport, and you have to see it for what it is. So you have to identify the individual. You have to identify what they wanted to own a horse for. And well, when it gets right down to it, I've never met a girl that didn't like a horse. And you throw in a pretty backdrop, and you have a wonderful facility. And we started looking at the opportunity of agritourism. You bring in a wedding. You bring in a special event. And you're able to supplement your farm and support your farm and not necessarily give the house away to, to board more horses. And so it made you a better operator. It made you a better business. But it also made you a phenomenal neighbor to the agricultural entity that's right next to you. And from that, uh, we continue to grow on the agritourism, moving over to production. Uh, having come in from the hospitality industry, working resorts and hotels as a chef, I got back into growing some vegetables and herbs and put up a greenhouse. And we started looking at the organic process. Uh, our barn is over an acre in footprint, and so we collect rainwater and we use it for our irrigation. And not only did we, we start growing vegetables and herbs, we were propagating our, our landscaping stock to improve on the facility and the look. And the more we improved on that, the better response we had. Because believe it or not, when you go to a farm, they don't want to see some of the, they don't want to see the sausage grinder per se. They want to feel good and see all the nice things, and they want it to be a happy and a safe place to visit. And so with all of that going on, someone came along and introduced hops. And it was, ah, we're not, we're not going to grow hops. This is, we're in wrong climate. It's too hot. It's too this. It's too that. You, you read all the books. And well, it's not always true. Uh, there's, there's several varieties and several species that work well in Virginia. Hops, uh, Cascade, is a, it's kind of the weed of, of the hop plant for the mid-Atlantic. Nugget will do well here, too. It takes a little bit more love, a little more, a little more time. And then Chinook will do well, but that, that also has some, some issues where you need to study on and, and really focus on the, the growth patterns. Uh, it's a perennial plant. It's going to come back every year, but it's a 20-year cycle. You could lose them. And every year we lose a dozen or more. And so we propagate, cut rhizomes. We, we grow them in the greenhouse. And we started off with 90 plants, and we got stock from North Carolina. And uh, it did really well. It did surprisingly well. And we looked at the water consumption. And in Virginia, as you know, you hit July and you can't buy a raindrop. And so we're looking at the water consumption, three gallons per plant per week. That's a lot of water. And uh, we started looking at the roof again. 
And we were collecting that rainwater. Just a little bit of dew off the roof would water that plant for a week. And so through the, the, the milder season of June, and it's the beginning of July, and then later in August and September, that, that works. But if you didn't have a raindrop, then you're completely relying on other water sources, whether it's your well or a stream or something like that. We, we had a pretty good harvest the first couple years. And we went out to the breweries and, and we sold a, a little bit, not a lot. Um, a little bit disappointing on how many we were actually able to sell. And uh, we, we kind of had to circle back and say, all right, what are we doing wrong here? And so, and so that's when your model changed, right? Because you had the hops and you had uh, this world-class facility here that you were doing weddings at and things like that. So what kind of decision went into actually taking the hops and starting to make your own beer? It wasn't easy. The, the, the decision came from we couldn't sell them. And, and you, can't, you can't blame the brewery. They don't know when your hops are going to be done. We didn't know when our hops were going to be done. And you go to the brewery, and, and many of the breweries, were, they're fantastic people. They really are. And you go in and say, hey, I can bring you this much. Well, how much can you bring? Well, I don't know till I harvest. You know, there's so many variables with, with agricultural production. And we turned to the USDA and said, we need some help. You know, what, what's out here for us? What, what can the extension agent do for us? And, and over the last several years, uh, Virginia Tech has gotten involved. And they are starting to a hot production facility down there where they're doing a, they have a research farm, which for us is just incredible. Because every time we'd have a mistake, it's, you know, go back to the drawing board, go to the computer, go to the library, go to another hop producer, and try to get some answers. And we pursued the organic pattern, and that makes it a, it, an incredibly difficult process to do. But we did that because we didn't want to find out that we were putting something in our beer that we didn't want in the beer. So every year we fight Japanese beetles. And some people say, hey, let them eat. Just let them eat the plants. And you're going to harvest them in a couple weeks anyway, you'll be fine. And then other people say, you know, spray them. Well, if you spray them, is that going to end up in my beer? I didn't want that. So we just kept looking and trying and trying again. USDA came back and worked with us extensively and, and, and basically had, a, had a, an unusual answer, in my opinion. And that answer was, you need to make your own beer. Don't worry about selling them. And then when they do come in, you plan when, when the beer is going to be made and that harvest ale will get produced on that particular day. And when you take that and you look at it, we already had a significant investment in this facility. Uh, it was kind of stifling to think about how much more we could grow uh, because we're basically off the grid. You know, it's our well water, it's our own septic system, it's our own, you know, we have to bring in the electric, of course, and we have to bring in propane. But for that, you know, we didn't have the luxury of being in, in, a, in a business park and just dialing into the uh, water sewer. And looking back, it's a whole lot more attractive, but the advantages are the water coming out of the ground is, is almost absolutely perfect for brewing. So we don't have to do anything there. So we ended up having more benefits in, in brewing on property than we, than we originally thought. Some of the negative sides of that was uh, we had to be a little bit smaller than what we wanted to be on paper. We wanted to be a much larger brewing facility, but because we're so far removed, we had to put a lot more investment into water treatment. And uh, we have a gray water system now that we, could, we use the wastewater from the brewery and we water our hops. And then we also have other treatments for the tasting room and so on. But that investment alone can, can exceed what some people's buildings cost. Mm -hmm. And so when you started seeing all this on paper, it started getting really, really interesting. And the USDA, I was fortunate enough to be put through with a group of consultants. And uh, you really just get an education. It's like going back to college. And they just test everything for you. And, and I've had my own businesses now since uh, 1998. And I've worked for myself ever since. And when you make a mistake, it comes right out of your checkbook. And you don't, you don't report to anybody. You report to your customer. You report to your checkbook. When you have a consultant or a marketing help or any of those things, that's, that's just it's unheard of. It's phenomenal. And it's something that you really have to embrace. And so even though I had one foot out the door the entire time, I had the other two feet run in the other direction saying, no, I really want to try this. How can I make this work? Well, they test it on paper, you fail on paper. And then when you fail on paper, you change directions. When you failed in your own business, it just cost you money. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you can sustain and you didn't go too far. And having a lot of that experience as a business operator, I knew that there's a lot of mistakes that are going to be made here because this is uncharted territory for me. I brewed beer in uh, commercial settings and commercial restaurants uh, as a chef and probably not at the right place or the right time. And at the time, didn't know any better. 
and you don't have the right equipment, or you don't have the right procedure, or you made the wrong mistake, or you used the wrong strain of yeast, or you didn't chill it down to wart fast enough, and you have all these impacts on making your beer. Well, so I had a background, a little bit of playing with it, and over the years kind of got better at it. I even tried to make some wine and, and messed around with that process. And there's, th there's just certain things that you have to do. And if you don't have the right tools to do it, then you need to stay home for the day and come back with the right tools. And you get involved with these consultants and they point you in the right direction. And then they, they kind of screen some of your people that are going to be your suppliers. And they screen the people that you're going to do business with. And they just save you days and weeks and hours and months. And they eliminate many of your mistakes. And it puts you on a path to, to be more successful. And, that, and I was fortunate to get that. Let's bring Cheryl into the conversation. Um, uh, Craig's talked about some of the challenges, certainly. I mean, right. uh, the number of challenges that go into the, the process and, and involving getting, getting USDA help in terms of uh, some advice and that kind of thing. We, we talked before we got on the air about a, state, a, a change in state law back in 2012. That was right. state bill 60, Senate Bill 604. Yeah. And essentially what that law did was it enabled, it really uh, unleashed the power of the craft beer industry. Okay. Uh, talk about that bill. It, essentially what it did was it allowed craft, brews, craft breweries to sell their, uh, their, their, their wares uh, on site without having to have food. Right. Uh, and what that, that, that's led to the explosion we've seen. Talk yeah. more about that if you could. Yeah, it, you know, um, like I said, or we talked about before, is July 2012. Um, you know, we did have Queen City Brewing in downtown Stanton, but it was really, that was for locals. You could come in and brew your own beer. You could, you know, taste a two ounce, but you couldn't hang out there. Um, so it wasn't really a, um, an experience for visitors to have. So, uh, you know, it, it's people like Devil's Backbone. You know, um, I, I know they've been bought by Anheuser-Busch now, but um, that really paved the way for smaller breweries to be open. Um, you know, they... We should really thank them for lobbying for this bill to be passed. So, um, so since then we've just seen an explosion in the area. I mean, in Harrisonburg and Stanton, and now in Augusta County and Waynesboro. You know, how much of an impact, economic impact, do the breweries have right now? I know Stanton, Waynesboro, and Augusta is kind of an emerging area as far yeah. as craft breweries are concerned. But how much of an economic impact does it have? You know, in Stanton, I know you probably know those numbers, but in the region yeah. as a whole. Yeah. Um, you know, in, I would say ours really, it, it's been about three years, you know. And what we have seen is um, an increase in our hotel occupancy, you know. I mean, people want you want to stay the night if you're going to go out and have have a few beers so and and it's all walkable in in downtown Stanton so we've seen about an eight and a half percent increase in our hotel occupancy in the last three years so and we've you know folks who uh, are watching this show uh, may be familiar with again kind of anecdotally their own favorite place to go uh, Nelson County Admiral County on the other side of the Blue Ridge have had uh, success in recent years, the vineyards there, the breweries, the cideries that have that have opened up, um, and, and I, I know that uh, if you drive up and down 151, you'll pass buses, you'll see those little mini buses or the big buses up and down the road there. Um, the Shenandoah Bear Works Trail is still relatively new. You're a few yes. months into your run. Talk about what kind of things might be coming up in terms of the promotional efforts that you'll be engineering here. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, we did get a $50,000 grant from the state, um, and that's all for marketing. Um, and that's going to be uh, print, digital, social. Um, you know, that we're going to do it. We're, we're almost out of our rack cards that we printed back in May, you know. So, um, but also we're expanding the promotion. Um, some of our hotels have gotten on board. Um, they're, they're selling packages for the Shenandoah Beer Works, which is great. Stonewall Jackson Hotel is one of those examples. Um, and then now we're, we're getting ready to start um, uh, brewery tours. And Shenandoah Tours that's located in Stanton, um, Steve Everidge, he's just, we just got all of the information from him. It's going to be between $50 to $80 per person. You're going to get lunch, and you're going to get to see three breweries, and you're going to have a driver. So. And Craig, we've talked about this in the past. I mean, you know, kind of jumping on what she said there, um, you both generally agritourism, but specifically craft beer. Uh, you know, see, seeing more places for people to come and visit means that they can kind of hop from here to here to here. And, and you're going to, you're obviously a part of the tour of the Chanel Beer Works, but uh, 
you opened in April with Stablecraft Brewery, uh, and things have really grown since then. At first, you were available just at Stablecraft, but recently you signed a distribution deal uh, to get out into some restaurants across the area. Uh, you're, you're putting some plans into the works to have bottling next year. I mean, this is this is growing pretty quickly from from opening in April to within a year, maybe you know, being out in restaurants and then uh, being out there available uh, in bottles. Uh, Take people through that growth. If that, that growth pattern has just been faster than what we anticipated. Uh, we put it on paper. We've blown those numbers to pieces. Uh, we've been able to do that because we're an agritourism site. We are bringing in anywhere from one to three weddings a weekend, and that's a captive audience that's very interested in what we're doing without any promotion whatsoever. Uh, and then the tasting room itself is just an attraction, and people are coming out and getting the experience on the farm. They're seeing the hops grow. They get to see the horses. It's just there's so much to offer there, and you're you're in the middle of farm country, and there's there's it's the real deal. There's a lot of farming going on around us, and you'll see the combines running on the corn and the soy right next to us, and there's dairy cows up the road, and, and then we've had our horses and, and so on. So I mean, it's all painted with the Blue Ridge Mountains in the background, and it doesn't get any more Shenandoah Valley than that. Uh, that being said. The product going out the door has just been flying, and we're supporting that product with uh, food on premise with, with our catering operation. Uh, so we're just supporting the beer with food. We're not trying to be a full-blown restaurant. Uh, we had initially set out to create eight jobs, um, six of those full-time. And we are at 17 jobs now with uh, 12 of those full-time. And with the bottling line, the bottling equipment is on premise now. We're adding a couple more fermenters. We have two more fermenters in the mix, so that'll bring us up to capacity on refrigeration, and then we've got to add on more buildings. Uh, and we're getting ready to build another building for our bottling operation and hopefully have bottles in the market by January, February. Uh, with the addition of that space, those fermenters and that bottling, we, we anticipate five more full-time jobs just in the bottling area. Um, we didn't pre foresee that. But we're taking advantage of the popularity. We're taking advantage of the, 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 the respect of the beer. Uh, and, it, and it wasn't us. We didn't do it by ourselves, by, by any stretch of the imagination. You know, Stanton's responsible for that. Harrisonburg's responsible for that. Uh, Nelson County. And it just goes on and on and on. And there's a lot of pioneers out there that got it all started. And they got beat up in the process to get us to where we are today. And we're thankful for that. Uh, nobody knows what it's like to open a business until you open a business. And you get beat up. And that's just as simple as it is. And you need support from your government agencies and your mm -hmm. government's uh, support systems out there. So the Beer Works Trail is just another huge, huge feather in, uh, in the capacity of marketing. Mm -hmm. Because you have to get your message out there. And if you're on a farm like we are, nobody knows you're out there. Right. And you have to tell them. And you need that marketing muscle to, to let people know. We just have a couple minutes left, Craig, but one thing I'm curious about is, did you ever imagine that this would become such a big part of your business when you decided in the very beginning, okay, no matter what they say, no matter how many times on paper I'm going to fail, we're going to move forward with this, and you've opened your restaurant, you're in your brewery with some food, you're in restaurants now, you're talking about bottling. I imagine this has become a much bigger part of your day-to-day -day operation than maybe you ever imagined. It is. It, it consumes me eight days a week and 36 <laughs> hours a day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, you know, you don't work a day when you love your job. And uh, there's not a day that goes by that, I, that I, I don't sit on the couch. I get out there and I get up with my staff and we, we just try to work with everybody and, and we get out and, and the, the response in the market has been great. The products received really well, and, and we're fortunate to be on tap at many of the restaurants in our community. And uh, we hope that we'll do the same thing with the bottles. I was going to ask Cheryl. It seemed, from listening to Craig explain, you know, his theory behind how how Stablecraft works, it reminds me of when Crystal and I go out and do our own little tours uh, of the Valley in the 151 area. Um, as much as anything else, it's the experience that people are looking for. It really is. And is that what you're marketing is that, the experience? It is what we're marketing. I mean, because there are breweries all over Virginia. So what our trail is supposed to, what we're trying to do is that we have actual farm breweries, you know, um, and the Shenandoah Valley is so beautiful with hiking and outdoor recreation. So we're, that's what we're really trying to marry with our, with our breweries. How do people find out about the Beer Works Trail? How do they find out who's included on that and get more information? Um, we have rack cards, and then our website is beerworkstrail.com. 
It's a neat website. Uh, I mentioned when we were talking about this earlier, Crystal, you can kind of map out your, your travel of the Beer Works Trail from Lexington to Harrisburg, Harrisburg to Lexington, whichever direction you want to go. Uh, and uh, you get to see, again, the different uh, brews that they offer there. So uh, it's a real advantage. You know, it's, it kind of centralizes everything there and makes it easier for the for the the, the tourists to, to make tourists whether you're a tourist from outside or the, those of us who live here to kind of plant plot your travels there yes and it sounds like now with a Shenandoah tours you know that they're going to be able to actually go on these guided tours as well you know and be able to experience some of the breweries that perhaps you haven't been to yet even for us locals so. that's right that's right well this has been interesting I think hopefully folks back home have learned a little bit more about this industry it's a billion dollar industry just in Virginia you know, 122,000 jobs nationwide, and it's something that uh, it's just going to continue to grow because uh, it's, it's not going to go anywhere at this stage. So. Well, and it's, it's exciting to see it growing in Virginia. It's exciting to see it grow specifically in our region and to see it being such a big contributor to, you know, to the economic bottom line as well. Indeed. Well, join us at, on Facebook, uh, on the WVPT Facebook page. We'll discuss more about this. For Viewpoints, I'm Chris Graham. I'm Crystal Graham. Have a great night, everybody.